Hello, and thanks for joining me. When an apologist tells me that if God doesn't exist, then it's just my personal preference that, say, murder is wrong, I usually respond 01100101, 01001011. They say, what are you doing? I say, I'm just speaking your language. They say, what? I say, well, you're a robot, right? They say, of course not. I say, then you don't get to substitute someone else's moral judgment for your own. I don't care if it's God, Zeus, or your Uncle Ted. So you tell me, why is murder being wrong not just your personal preference? At this point, they will either give me a very good answer, an answer that might be used by an atheist, or they will give me an answer that Isaac Asimov would be proud of. Either way, they completely undercut the moral argument for God's existence. The gist of which is that we need God to exist in order to say that murder is wrong. The moral argument is usually phrased, like the Kalam argument, as a simple syllogism. If objective morals exist, then God exists. Objective morals exist, therefore, God exists. The simple expression of the argument is deceptive. Moral philosophy is a vast and sprawling topic, stretching from the pre-Socratics to Immanuel Kant to G.E. Moore to Sam Harris. A quick search on the JSTOR database before making this video gave me well over half a million hits on a search for moral philosophy. It's an incredibly large field. I was a professor of ethics and moral philosophy. Motherforker! But with the second premise, the moral argument seeks to jettison all of it except for objective moral realism. And with the first, it seeks to jettison all but theistic models of objective moral realism. Honestly, you can't help but admire the audacity of the apologist. Which is why it's so surprising that the main weapon in his arsenal is the appeal to emotion. Here, for instance, is how William Lane Craig describes it. On the atheistic view, there's nothing morally special about human beings. They're just accidental byproducts of nature that have evolved relatively recently on an infinitesimal speck of dust called the planet Earth, lost somewhere in a hostile and mindless universe, and doomed to perish individually and collectively in a relatively short time. Look at his choice of wording here. Lost, hostile, mindless, perish, doom. You see what he's doing, right? Here's another way of saying the exact same thing. On the atheistic view, there's nothing cosmically or divinely morally special about human beings. They are fortunate byproducts of nature that have evolved a very long time ago by human standards in an enormous biosphere called the planet Earth, freely wandering a challenging but non-judgmental universe and destined to complete our lives individually after a span of decades, but collectively, perhaps not for a very long time indeed. That doesn't make atheism sound so bad, does it? Which is why apologists like Craig don't put it that way. For the two passages are saying pretty much the same thing, which tells me that any point the apologist might be making here is an entirely emotional one. But still, if God doesn't exist, the apologist will say, then it's just our personal preference that, say, white supremacists are wrong. They make it sound like we walk into an ice cream shop and say, hmm, do I want chocolate flavor? Do I want cookie flavor? Nah, I'll get the white supremacists are wrong flavor. That sounds good today. Like, logic and reason have nothing to do with it. Or they'll say that we only go along with the idea that white supremacists are wrong because the society around us, the Christian society around us, expects us to say it. Never mind the fact that the outspoken white supremacists out there tend to be just as anti-atheist as mainstream Christian apologists. Given that the white supremacists in the ranks of Christians can and will point to both scripture and direct communication from God to support their views, how can the mainstream apologists say it's anything more than personal preference that they're wrong? They can say the white supremacists are interpreting scripture wrong, but what makes their standards of interpretation right or wrong? Surely, if one is receiving a direct communication from God, informing them that their standards of interpretation are correct, that overrides any human use of logic and reason. And the white supremacist Christians are claiming exactly that. And the mainstream apologists will claim, of course, that God is telling them exactly the opposite. But to the outsider, this only looks like a game of they said, they said, which in turn lends credence to the view that the diversity of religious experience is evidence against the existence of God. See my video interview with two theists for more details. In my view, if morality can only be grounded in God, then this leads at best to radical moral skepticism. We can never reliably know what is and is not moral. Even under a secular moral theory, this would be difficult, but under theistic morality, it's impossible, even if we grant that God exists, because there's simply no way to determine that one is not talking to God. This, of course, is a flaw not for theistic moral grounding, but for theistic moral epistemology. 
The Christian can always bite the bullet and say, well, we may never know for certain what right and wrong is, but at least we know that right and wrong exist, absolutely and objectively. I'll turn back to the subject of moral grounding in a moment, but first, here's a question to ponder. Would you prefer a morality which is subjective to the frame of reference of the human race, which we can know, or a morality which is cosmically objective, which we can never know? Which do you think is better for the human race? So let's talk about an objective morality that doesn't involve God. Very broadly speaking, there are two ways to ground objective morals if God does not exist. One is moral anti-reductionism, under which moral truths exist in an a-causal reality, a reality in which things neither are nor can be caused, so there is no possibility of God having put them there. This basically follows what Plato wrote in his dialogues. The standard apologist answer to this is that a-causal reality is incompatible with atheism. But it's not. Spend your entire professional life trying to derive a logical contradiction between a causal moral truths exist and God does not exist, and you will fail. At most, you will show that anti-reductionism is incompatible with strict materialism or physicalism. But in my judgment, there are fewer strict materialists in the atheist community than you might think. I, for instance, am not a materialist. Apologists will usually associate atheism with materialism, partly because the most prolific atheist organization in existence, American Atheists, advocates a worldview predicated on Greek materialism. To what extent its members actually subscribe to this worldview is unknown, and partly because materialism is just easier to attack than atheism, especially from an emotional angle. Do you really believe you're just a bag of chemical reactions, molecules in motion, etc., etc.? But atheism does not entail materialism, and no matter how many existential crises you trigger in your audience, you will never make it so. The other way to ground objective morals without God is reductive moral naturalism, under which moral truths are reducible to, they derive from, or even mean the same thing as facts about the natural universe. This basically follows what Aristotle taught. Now more often than not, the apologist's response to this is... They kind of just hope you don't know that that's an option. Sometimes they will strawman the whole thing as what they call a Darwinian view of survival of the fittest, or might makes right. But if you read those philosophers who propose that moral truths are grounded in evolutionary biology, you probably won't be surprised to learn that they're incredibly more sophisticated than that. They can give excellent reasons why, for instance, our instinct that compassion is right has its grounding in evolutionary biology. Sometimes the apologists will argue that evolution is false. <laughs> But any argument for the falsehood of evolution that does not take the form of a citation from a reputable peer-reviewed journal of the life sciences can, should, and will be completely ignored. There are those on YouTube who will give creationists the time of day. At this time in my life, I'm not one of them. The only other response to reductive moral naturalism that comes up is that it commits the naturalistic fallacy by attempting to derive ought statements from is statements. But to simply call it a fallacy is to beg the question. Why should God be the ground of morality, whether that ground comes from his nature or from his commands? Look at it this way. If I suggested that John Lithgow is the ground of all morality, that his character and or his commands determine what is right and wrong, you simply wouldn't accept that. In what relevant way is God different from John Lithgow? He's immortal and John Lithgow isn't, but why is that relevant? He's all-powerful and John Lithgow isn't, although even at the age of 76, I certainly wouldn't want to take him in a fight. But why should the ability to do things make you the ground of morality? He's all-knowing and John Lithgow isn't, but why should having all factual information in the universe available in your mind make you the ground of morality? Unless morality can be derived from that information, but that leads us to reductionist moral naturalism. He's all-loving while John Lithgow is merely, you know, a good guy, but why should that be relevant? People often do immoral things for love. The only possible attribute of God that is relevant to whether he might be the ground of morality is his holiness, which Merriam-Webster defines as being exalted or worthy of complete devotion as one perfect in goodness and righteousness. But even this assumes an independent standard of morality by which it is to be judged whether God is perfectly good and perfectly righteous. Otherwise, we're still entitled to ask, what is it that makes God perfectly good and perfectly right? Why isn't it that John Lithgow was worthy of being exalted? Oh my God! I'm gorgeous! <laughs> there seem to be no answers to these questions that don't either make morality arbitrary or make God unnecessary.
There's also the ought is problem, the problem referenced when theists use the naturalistic fallacy fallacy. What is it that gives God's commands, or even his essential nature or character, any kind of normative force? Say God commands Bill to press the blue button. How do we get from that to Bill is morally obligated to press the blue button? If you don't like divine command theory and would rather say that there's some kind of pressing the blue buttonness in God's nature or character, how do we get from that to Bill is morally obligated to press the blue button? What gives God moral authority? The fact that he can beat us up? The fact that he knows everything? The fact that he somehow embodies characteristics that we humans have decided are good ones? Why should any of these things, or even a combination of them, give God moral authority? When apologists attack non-theistic morality, they do so from the perspective of a moral skeptic, even though they themselves are not moral skeptics. They claim that these systems cannot give moral skeptics reasons to be moral, or to think that morals exist. They ignore the fact that the moral skeptic can raise the exact same challenges against theistic morality. And that's the point of this section. Theistic morality gives no advantage over non-theistic morality when it comes to answering the challenges of the moral skeptic. Both are problematic. Both can think of ways around these problems. From the moral skeptic's position, neither comes out on top. Which means theism gives no advantage over naturalism in explaining why and how moral truths exist. The only way, then, to support the major premise of the moral argument, that if objective morals exist, then God exists, is to think of a blanket objection to all non-theistic theories of morality. I can think of three possible blanket objections. First is that secular theories of moral realism lack an ontology that grounds ethical beliefs. But I discussed this earlier. Objective morals can be objectively grounded in a causal reality or a naturalistic causal reality. Second is that if morals are non-theistic, then people are free to reject them. But under theism, people are free to reject God. The theist response to that is, it doesn't matter, God can get along just fine with people's rejection. Just so. A moral theory, if true, can get along just fine even if people reject it. And indeed, even within theism, no moral theory is universally accepted. Third is that people have no motivation to follow a non-theistic moral system. But the only advantage that theism has here, in other words, the only motivation that can be offered for following a theistic moral system which could not be adapted into a non-theistic moral system, is the threat of hell. The doctrine of hell is one of the most pernicious inventions the human mind has ever come up with. So much so that it is in fact rejected by many if not most contemporary Christians. Most non-theistic moral systems would include as a moral duty, if a torture chamber exists, to repudiate its creator. So I consider this to be not an objection to secular morality, but a point in its favor. There doesn't seem to be a successful blanket objection to non-theistic morality. So premise one of the moral argument fails. Now, there's a gaping hole in my discussion of the moral argument. I'm assuming that moral realism is true and that objective morals do exist. I don't discuss the possibility that morality might be subjective, or that moral truths simply might not exist. This is because I am a moral realist and a moral objectivist. But moral subjectivism is, in my view, a perfectly reasonable view to take. The only reason I haven't defended the position is that I don't hold it. A fact which, every time I mention it, raises a few eyebrows in the comments section. Moral objectivism seems to be a minority viewpoint in the atheist community, or at least a non-vocal majority. So I decided for this video it was important to include a moral subjectivist's viewpoint. Keith Augustine, the executive director of Internet Infidels, puts it like this. What we have in ethics, as in aesthetics, are basic criteria that we invent. In the absence of objective moral values, we can have basic intersubjective moral standards, but intersubjective is still subjective. Instead of morality being based on a single individual's opinions, it can be based on the common elements of several individuals' opinions, but opinions they still are. They are not moral laws existing independently of human opinion inherently in nature. Indeed, it would be quite odd to say that objective moral standards would exist if sentience never arose in the universe or all sentient beings were extinct. For the record, I don't think the absence of sentient beings would pose a problem for objective morality, any more than the absence of perfect circles in the universe poses a problem for Euclidean geometry, upon which many real-world tasks rely. But moral subjectivism is a rational and well-supported position, even if it's not my own, and to those who hold it, it gives additional ammunition against the moral argument. For in order to support premise 2 of the argument, the apologist must refute this position. 
Some philosophers have likened morality to the rules of chess. These rules are intersubjective, to use Augustine's term, to all chess players in the world. They are not objectively binding on anyone who doesn't play chess. But within the framework of those rules, within that frame of reference, it is objectively wrong to move a rook diagonally. I think this is a good way to get the point across. Moral subjectivism has its problems, of course it does. So does moral naturalism, so does moral anti-reductionism, so does theistic morality, so does moral nihilism. And this all brings us back to the whole point. The point that theistic morality does not give any advantage over other theories of morality in such a way that we are rationally compelled to accept it and therefore theism. And that is why the moral argument for the existence of God fails. If you enjoyed this video and want to help my channel grow, please hit the like, share, and subscribe buttons. Be sure to hit the bell to be notified when a new video comes out. And if you want to share your thoughts on morality, the moral argument, or the acting chops of John Lithgow, leave a comment below. Thank you so much for joining me, and we'll see you in the next video. I'm David John Wellman, and the rest is up to you.